So imagine you're a pastor. Not too hard for me. Or a few others here. We have more than two today. And imagine you're in a remote location about 18 miles outside the Chicago metropolitan area. And you look up and you see droves of people coming to hear you and see you. What would you say? How would you greet them? I've got a lot of Minnesota nice in me. I'm from Minnesota. I think I would say something like, welcome, so glad you're here. Now, I'm not always Minnesota nice, but that's, that's, that's built into me. Um, but of course, that's not what John the Baptist said, was he? What did he say? Anybody see that? Happy Advent, you brood of vipers. <laughs> you brood of vipers. Are you kidding me? I guess the Chicago equivalent might be, you bunch of rats. Who brought you in from the alley? I'm serious. I mean, this, these are snakes in the Middle East. They do not play. And once John, though, gets this insult out of his system, he delivers a word. Not perhaps always a word they wanted to hear, but a word they needed to hear. All week I've been trying to get my head around John the Baptist, even though I've preached about him for one to two Sundays in Advent for 16 years or however long I've been a pastor, I've been trying to get my head around why so many people are traveling to where he is to hear him and be baptized. Baptism really wasn't even a thing before John the Baptist started doing his thing. And especially when you look at the geography, the topography, and the terrain. Thank you, Emmanuel. So this is, go back, go back. This is the geography. So you see Jerusalem is uh, there with the first red arrow down to the left a little bit. And then you have to go to Jericho, past Jericho to where G, uh, John was baptizing people, which is Bethany beyond the Jordan. So this was 18 miles to get from Jerusalem, let's say. I mean, we're big city folk around here, so I'm just assuming everyone's from Jerusalem in our, in our uh, role play here. And uh, not only that, but look at the topography. It's an 1,800-foot drop between Jerusalem and Bethany beyond the Jordan. So you're literally heading eventually downhill with a lots of ups and downs. And then... Let me show you what the road looks like. This is an actual recent photograph of the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. You'll recall this was a dangerous road. Why do we know that? Because of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. He was on the road to Jericho, the same road someone would take moving from Jerusalem to Bethany beyond the Jordan. So people went through a lot especially those from Jerusalem, just to get to John the Baptist. So back to the original question. Why so many people? The people are coming to John with spiritual hurt and spiritual hunger. And John gave them a word that both comforted them in their pain and afflicted them and incited them enough to grow beyond what they knew and what they had been. I mean, I'm just thinking about this practically, too. I mean, do you think the first day John the Baptist decided to come out of his Essenes community, a monastic community, living mostly in caves, basically where we found the 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 Dead Sea Scrolls, and you think that moment he decided, okay, I'm going to go public with my preaching, he stands up, wipes the honey and, and, and the locust shards from his beard, Ew. must have taken a little bit of cleaning, and he yells, repent! Do you think the people just came in droves? You think that was, like, really just going to kick it off? Here's what probably happened. I was just trying to think, how did this happen? A 
single mom, a widow, and child stops by the road. John speaks some word of comfort. A centurion who's being redeployed to a new city stops for a rest along the road, starts hearing John the Baptist preach. A religious scribe who is on his way to an important festival in Jerusalem. Here's this guy yapping, but then realizes it's not just yapping, it's preaching, and it might be for him. And all these people have their minds and their hearts changed. And they go into the water, and the living word envelops them in the water, and they arise with the baptism of the forgiveness of sins. They are changed, and then they go back to their locations, or they go, back to, they go to their destination, and they're saying, something happened to me on the road. I got met by grace. I got met with a challenge. I got met with a reorientation and a transformation, and I'm not the same. I'm thinking differently, and I'm behaving differently. And I want you to hold me accountable. And I actually think I have an exhortation for you. You should go see John the Baptist. I feel better having come up out of that water. And I think you'd feel better too. And so I think that's what's going on in the person of John the Baptist. If you are hurting and hungry, he will give you words of comfort that once again fill your hearts with hope. And if you're feeling full of yourself, a little bit too comfortable, he will bring you down to size. He will give you words of challenge, and with that forgiveness, he will give you a way out, a release from that guilt that lies just beneath the surface. How's everyone feeling this morning? Feeling comfortable? Then God might be here to remind you have a, you have a coat to share or some resources to bless someone with. Or are you feeling afflicted? No matter how you're feeling, and perhaps raise your hand if it's a little bit of both. <laughs> Probably a little bit of both, right? Um, God has a word for us wherever we're at. I mean, and, and, and just to look at how John did it and how John is being used for us in our walk today. Imagine how comforting it was for those who were suffering in poverty to hear, <clears throat> every valley shall be filled Every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. Of course, this is from Isaiah. This is not just empty prose. This is talking about justice, shalom, a reallocation of priorities and resources in real time in society. And of course, Martin Luther King knew that this passage was talking about social justice and how we relate to one another as well as systems and structures. That's why he loved quoting this passage. That is good news for those who are oppressed. And then when we look at his responses to those wonderful questions that come at him, I mean, I think there's many good responses we would love as preachers to hear after a sermon, but I don't think there's a better question than what then shall we do? <laughs> yes, yes, let's talk about that. What do we do with this word that comes to us? In his responses, they're not only practical and challenging to those who have, think about how comforting they must have been for the have-nots, for those who have no coat, they heard Jesus say, if you have two coats, share one. Imagine how comforting it would have been for those who were ripped off multiple times by tax collectors. And John tells them, you know, just collect what you're supposed to collect. Can you imagine the relief that you'd feel with that notion 
as someone who had been ripped off over and over again. The good news that God brings through John the Baptist are not just platitudes for the poor. It's not just thoughts and prayers. It's action. It's jobs. It's economic justice. It's health care. It's affordable housing. It's good schools. It's safe neighborhoods. It's partnerships that make things possible and bring shalom to life. At the same time as it comforts the afflicted. It's awesome. And then, of course, God gives a word that afflicts the comfortable. And I'm just going to raise up one thing that John says that I think is, is super interesting. And it kind of hits us where we live today. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For God, can, I tell you, is able to raise up from these stones children of Abraham. John calls out, especially the religious communities, pride and sense of privilege. That they are better than everyone else. And they can see the world through, we're the good ones, and everyone else is kind of suspect. That's what John's calling out here. Those of you riding on pride and a blindness to privilege, you need to check yourself. In fact, you religious people, and Jesus backed him up, right? You religious people are more in need of repentance and a change of heart than anyone else. To me, in our moment, I feel like this word speaks especially to white citizens, myself included, of the church and of our country to acknowledge the reality of white privilege and to do the hard but necessary work of anti-racism and acknowledging the systems and the structures that are hurting people both in the religious context and in our societal context. We are in need of a word just as much or more than anyone else this morning. So what's a word that's connecting with you today? Is it comfort? Is it challenge? I'll close by lifting up this word that Luke uses to summarize John the Baptist's ministry in verse 18. It says, so with many other exhortations. Have you ever heard the word exhort outside of church? I don't think I have. But it's a great word, and so I looked it up. Exhort comes from the Latin, which means to encourage or to incite. <laughs> Isn't that great? So in this sermon about comfort and uh, challenge, the word means both. It can literally mean both. But exhort, in this case, is a translation of the Greek word parakleo. Kleo meaning to call. And para, meaning to come alongside. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. To call alongside. Even though it's the word of God, even though John is the great prophet, it's not God coming down on us with heavy judgment. It's coming alongside us to lead us into the water, to wash us clean, and to change our hearts and our habits toward kingdom living. If you are hurting this morning, receive God's comfort and existential hope. And if you are comfortable, share your blessings with those in need and work to change the systems and structures to look more like the coming reign of God. Amen.